this work. So that is an important theme as mental health professionals. You have to figure out how to take care of yourself. You have to be aware, and you have to be that present so that you know what you need in order to maintain your own wellness in dealing with these difficult cases. So the second theme was professional experiences, which explored their perspectives of the experiences of young survivors. So their personal experience is more about themselves. Their professional experience is more their reflections on the young survivors. Um, the second theme is broken down into sub-themes of post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth, which is the negative and positive outcomes of child sexual abuse on their clients. The third theme was counseling roles. So it explored the traditional roles of counseling, what we traditionally think of as the one-to-one, -one, um, versus the expanding roles of mental health professionals. And the last theme was the systemic influences. It described the negative influences and the positive influences on the experiences of mental health professionals. And a sub theme of negative influences included um, family systems, sociocultural systems, and child protection systems. So this was a visual that I came up with, but basically I just described all that. So basically the personal is on the, in the, the centermost part because that's you know the, the the core of, of the professional, and then outside of that it would be their professional roles and then the systemic influences and how they they would um, interact with those systems would be the counseling roles. What did they do? So these are, um, in all of those themes, I, I drew out a, a significant quote under each theme. By all means, there were so many quotes that I could have um, used, so these are just one example. One, there's one example from each theme and sub-theme that I'm gonna go through. So these are the quotes from the mental health professionals who participants in my study. The calling. One of my last cases overseas was of a little girl who had been raped, and I was doing abuse investigations at the time. And when I found her, she was a heap in the corner of the floor. Basically, you couldn't even tell it was a little girl. And I named that participant Celeste. The impact. It always left me feeling frustrated, and I think not just helpless, but also angry that these were kids who were already vulnerable and who were victims, whether they acknowledged it or not. And then by the virtue of our response, in spite of sometimes our best effort and our best intentions, <laughs> like it was still falling way short of what should have been a standard response. I think that we did a huge disservice to probably like a generation, at least of kids, who were in that position. And that was a participant I named Diane. Self-care. It's important to kind of diversify your work, and not just have the focus just be on what you do when it's already happened, but to spend some time working in the prevention field. And I do get a lot of, I get a lot of my sense of making a difference from there, because sometimes the end result of the therapy, well, sometimes you just don't get an end result. The person just stops showing up. Person Andrew. Post traumatic stress. You listen to their stories. They had sort of been fending for themselves in lots of ways since they were maybe seven or eight, and in lots of cases, fending for younger siblings. And I would say that there were probably equal numbers of boys and girls who talked about situations where, I mean, they'd most often been incested by a family member. And that person was dying. So these are all mental health professionals that work here locally and have worked here for over two years. This is not a new phenomenon. And a lot of this was historical, were historical reflections of their practice from years ago. Post-traumatic growth. I think that the therapy does make a difference. I do think it makes a difference to really have someone who's not involved in all the dynamics of it remind you that this is not your fault. That there were adults that have to take responsibility, whether they were active participants or whether they were bystanders. I do think it's very reinforcing for a child to be reminded that this is not their fault. I don't care what you did. I don't care where you were. I don't care what you were wearing. I just, I just don't care. It's not your fault. That was Andrew. Speaking to traditional roles. There are different types of the work that I do. The therapy, the assessment, and like I said, definitely the education bit of it. Just trying to help the community to think a bit differently about how do we act, how do we protect children, and realize it's not the child's job to protect themselves, it's our job. That was Expanding goals. I 
felt like I was constantly dealing with the crisis of the day for this child. Who has not felt like that? <laughs> that was a precedent named me. Negative influences. It's a part of the fabric of Cayman. It's not something that's written down anywhere. But it's, in my opinion, a part of the fabric of our society. And until we accept that we will never be able to deal with it, culturally, we keep a lot of things bottled up. We keep a lot of things hidden. We are very much a prideful people. That was the last one. Positive influences. There already is improvement in terms of people recognizing to bring children in that, in that have been abused, that, that they need help, that there is an improvement. It's a relatively new idea that it's OK to go get help. And we've seen the numbers go up and up and up in terms of the number of cases that come in our door which I think that's a positive thing, recognizing that there are people that can help with this issue. That was me. So those were the voices from their words. So basically, although challenging, their experiences were also rewarding. Findings revealed their sense of purpose or personal calling was central to the positive experiences of these mental health professionals and propelled them to take action when faced with the maze of inadequacies within the child protection system. Although they lacked a cohesive collegial network to support and reinforce the post-traumatic growth achieved in counseling, these professionals compensated with significant personal and professional positive coping resources. They also expanded the traditional role of counselor to include advocate, educator, and community activist, activist working to change the local society to not only cope with the stresses of the work, but to create more opportunities for post-traumatic growth. So basically, I'm going to just breeze through this because I'm already out of time. Um, there are a lot of implications about, and we've talked about their needing, we need training across the board, across mental health professionals. Um, we can't have people who are supposed to help that don't really know what to do, even if they're well intended. So we need to have a lot of support for professionals and first responders um, and highly specialized intervention or training for the people giving the intervention. Oh. So in closing, although counseling can help survivors develop post-traumatic growth out outcomes, lasting positive change cannot occur without consideration of the systemic influences surrounding the survivor. It is not solely the counseling provided by a mental health professional that remediates the effects of abuse in a young survivor, but is it, it is in conjunction with the surrounding family, community, sociocultural environment, and institutional influences with which resilience, healing, and growth can occur. the 
so you understand where they're coming from, diagnostic consideration, um, as well as as um, I'll touch on treatment as well. So we've got a series of some of the statistics, one in five kids that have been um, well experienced with this at some time. So some interesting statistics, these are actually from the U.S., is that four, um, between four and five children die each day in the U.S. from abuse and neglect. Um, so you can see this really is a major public health concern. Uh, between 14% and 36% of um, adults in prison uh, report a history of abuse. Um, two thirds of persons in substance abuse treatment have a history of child maltreatment, not just abuse and neglect. And children who are abused are many times more likely to become involved in criminal activity. So I think in all the comments you guys made are really relevant to what's going on. So it's looking at a very similar picture to what's going on. Uh, so in looking at complex trauma, I first wanted to differentiate it between single incident trauma or type 1 trauma, which is going to be a one time event. So the person is functioning pretty well, something happens, an accident, um, an assault, something that's a one-off thing. And then um, they experience intense fear, hopelessness, or horror. Um, and this, is, this can be extremely traumatic for the person. But it's a one-time event and not something that is going to be prolonged over time. So then we have one versus type two, which is considered complex trauma. And this is going to be prolonged, chronic, or cumulative. This is going to be a lot of times an ongoing relationship. A lot of times complex trauma is interpersonal, which means it's done by another person. And it's often um, within a caregiving relationship or an intimate relationship. And so it's malicious. It's done by someone to you. And so that kind of trauma also tends to have a much stronger impact than something that's just an accident or something that's naturally occurring. And this kind of trauma a lot of times will um, happen during developmentally vulnerable times. So we'll be looking at particular days, can be um, childhood abuse. So looking at children, and someone said they know that their world is consumed by school and the family environment. So they're really, um, they're considered vulnerable because they're not on their own. But it can also occur at different times. Um, like I've done a lot of work with homeless stuff, so being in a disadvantaged position, um, so, um, socially or economically, uh, later on in life, when you're, or if you become ill, then you can be in a vulnerable position and experience. So uh, I did list some other kinds of complex trauma that um, people do experience, so things like homelessness, uh, community violence, not being able to escape it, uh, disenfranchised uh, uh, minorities within, this, within society, uh, sexual orientation, religious or ethno um, racial uh, identity, uh, incarceration, so being or put into a residential facility for a period of time, um, war and combat. So that's going to be, um, especially for men, that's going to be the most common form of um, stressor for PTSD, but also developmental, intellectual, mental health or health um, disability, as well as, uh, as Taylor touched on, some of the vicarious trauma from doing things like ER work and constantly being exposed to um, either serious uh, medical conditions in the ER, um, like medical trauma, or just being provided to work with this kind of um, population as well. Um, so looking at the neurological impact, and I love that video, you know, she really gets into all the impact that it has. Um, so I'll touch on it briefly again as well, because we can see that, you know, the, from the time that they're kids, there's biological changes that happen within their, within their bodies, within their brains, that will continue to affect them later on. And decreased cortex activity. The cortex is going to be the part that does a lot of the learning, the problem solving, and stuff that Augustine had touched on as well. Um, and we'll see that that's going to be something that will inhibit impulsivity, which causes a lot of difficulties um, in everything that we do. The increased limbic system activity is going to be heightened emotions. So that's really the hot part of the brain. And so we see heightened emotional responses to um, pretty much anything that goes on. Taking that bear home with you at night is what this is going to be. Uh, decreased hippocampal volume. And that's going to be the part that integrates memories and experiences. And so they think that that might be really the high stress hormones that are constantly being put through the brain. Uh, and the development of the left brain, uh, which is responsible for language, is a smaller corpus callosum, and that's the part that connects the two sides of the brain. That was interesting, they actually see increased activity through um, all parts of the brain in between both, so there seems to be more difficulties with integrating information uh, in adult survivors. Uh, we got the the chemicals of the neuroendocrine response. And so we've got the typical stress response
arms of the norepinephrine, the cortisol comes out. Cortisol is something that's in um, a lot of a lot of the news recently because they increase the belly fat, and then people don't like that. But that comes from this prolonged stress response, and they're dealing with these kinds of situations all the time. The body adjusts and doesn't a lot of times doesn't get a chance to readjust because of the things like food victimization that they're constantly being exposed to. Decreased thyroid production, so thyroid um, has an impact on metabolism as well as mood, and so a lot of times it will go down. Uh, but that yeah, will also um, increase um, hyperthyroidism. Looks a lot like anxiety. Hypothyroidism looks a lot like depression. So you can see how that will really play an impact within a person's mood. And this is interesting. This actually decreased gene expression in a gene that's responsible for the stress response. So you see there's a lot going on biologically for this person, a lot of these things will be going to them. The social impact. So what does this mean for everyone around us? A lot of times there's difficulties with um, establishing as well as maintaining relationships. Um, in trying to teach my students about this, I think that they have seen the Taylor Swift video of Blank Space. Um, a lot of my students thought she was crazy, but really that is kind of, that really characterizes a lot of what goes on in these people's lives. There's a lot of push and pull. There's feelings of not being able to trust others and always needing someone there as well. Um, so there's a lot of difficulties interpersonally. There's a lot of times lower academic achievement. Uh, they don't have got the cognitive changes that go on from the abuse, but a lot of times they don't have the resources available or the supports from the home system to be able to maintain what they need to in the academic environment. A lot of times there's delinquency, whether it's a survival mode, trying to get what they need, or if it becomes, um, you know, ways of kind of going against the system. Increased risk of teenage pregnancy. So look at the impact on the sexual relationships. Um, but a lot of times there is um, a lot of impulsivity, which is common puberty, uh, a lot of chances of poverty. Higher incidence of medical problems and substance use. Medical problems are likely due to a lot of the poverty as well as the, uh, the changes from the stress hormone. Substance use and the crimes that can come from the impulsivity. And difficulties establishing and uh, maintaining employment as well. So we'll see how that really impacts the economy. Because you know, each adult we need to be a contributing member within society. So with all of this going on, a lot of times it's hard enough to keep a job. Now, these numbers were pretty phenomenal. The cost of abuse in the US is was $124 billion in 2008. And so that is a large amount of, of money that's going towards supporting those people that are, if they're not able to get appropriate international <coughs> treatment. The average lifetime cost for victims of non-child, non-fatal child bond treatments of kids that survive the abuse and the neglect that they go through is $210,000. That includes childhood medical costs, adult medical costs, productivity losses, the days they're not able to go to work, the days they're not able to go to school, the days that, um, that they're performing and the sabbatical level. Uh, child welfare costs, a lot of times they do become points of the state or do the best gets involved. Or has a We've got the increased criminal activities. Uh, it's really special education costs. We're trying to help them get through school and get the gains that they're not, that they aren't able to make in the first place. Uh, but what was really mindful like, was the average cost per the death of a child. We said we've got between four and five children dying a day. In 2011, it was almost 1,600 children that were lost due to childhood abuse and neglect. And average lifetime cost per death is a million and three hundred thousand dollars. And that's a combination of medical costs as well as productivity losses for each person. Uh, you know, even with all the things that come with, you know, going through this kind of experience, they're still, if they're still able to be alive, they're still able to contribute. So with the deaths, we see a significant loss to society. And of course, the loss of a life in a person. So we can see the importance of this for everyone to understand it and to be able to play a part in um, addressing it. I love that prevention kept coming up, but also the impact that we can play on the treatment. Um, so we're going to look at difference with the conceptualization of the types of trauma, different diagnostic considerations, as well as the approaches to treatment. Uh, so I worked with um, Dr. Gold, and he, his approach to treatment is something called contextual therapy. And he looks at the traumatic impact of prolonged childhood abuse, and so this is going to be physical, sexual, emotional abuse, physical and emotional neglect uh, that goes 
and that's still their mom and still their dad. You know, that's important to remember that part. And there's always the good parts as well. There's, all, there's always good times that they can point to. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, there are good times, there's tension building phases where you start to notice the mood changing, kind of walking on eggshells. You're not really sure when the next thing is going to happen. And then we have an abusive incident, whether it's a physical fight, sometimes sexual abuse, and then a lot of times there's some, something that they, they do afterwards to try to mend the relationship as well. So we don't get the transmission of reasoning skills. There's a lot of impulsivity in these homes. Uh, they, know, they don't learn how to problem solve, how to think things through. Um, a lot of times they are so anxious. We do assess rating when they come in. Subjective units of distress, so it's arousal level. Zero, not anxious at all, and most anxious they've ever been. A lot of them are at 10, we'll say 25, you know, when they come in. And so, you know, this is something that they're living with all the time. And when you are that worked up, you know, can sit and think through three different ways of doing it and evaluate the most helpful way. You know, you do what comes to mind first, because you don't feel good now, so anything else has to be better than this. And we become quite impulsive, and a lot of times they end up just putting out fire. They have a negative view of themselves from the messages that are transmitted to them in the homes that they grow up in. You know, that they're not worthy, that they, they're unlovable, and that no one cares about them. As well as their view of others. You know, that others hurt them, others can't be trusted, others can't be counted on, and others won't help us. And so we see how all of that can kind of come together to, put, to bring in a pretty bleak picture of how they see themselves in the world. Um, so a lot of people get upset because they're like, oh, they're going to go on to abuse other people. But the odds are that they're more likely to be abused again themselves. So a lot of times when there is childhood abuse, we see um, abuse by other people as well as domestic violence around in their lives as well. Um, and the maladaptive behavior, so Dr. Addison alluded to a lot of the comorbid difficulties that we see as well. You know, that high level of tension, they'll do anything to break that. So a lot of times we see substance abuse. Um, drugs help you feel better, at least for a little while. Um, we see a lot of self-injurious behaviors, a lot of cutting, um, different kinds of self-harm. Uh, sexual impulsivity, a lot of promiscuity that goes on. Uh, jumping from relationships to relationships, sex is good, so we love. And it gets kind of keep going um, to alleviate distress. And actually, this population has one of the hallmarks is dissociation, which is something that is quite confusing for a lot of people. And it's the defense mechanism that is helpful as a child. Um, where actually when the abuse is going on, they kind of check out of their bodies. And it's a way of getting through the abusive episodes. Uh, a lot of them will describe it as kind of watching themselves because they see it happening to them. And so that, you know, is helpful as a child. It's the body's way of protecting them, the mind's way of protecting them from the abuse that's going on. The difficulty comes when that becomes uncontrollable or becomes their go-to. Anytime that they're stressed, they check out. Um, so um, in most survivors, we see some kind of dissociative episodes, sometimes where they don't really remember things. Uh, on the most severe spectrum, we have something called dissociative identity disorder, which was formerly multiple personality disorder. And so some of the people that we work with will actually be missing hours, days, or even weeks of time where they were alive and functioning but they have no recollection of it. So, um, so there's different ways that they learn to handle the distress that's going on for them. Um, so a diagnosis, any of you who are clinicians are probably trying to think, you know, you might have some ideas of um, diagnoses that would be going on. Um, anyone who's worked with them probably has some ideas as well. But with single incident traumas, uh, a lot of times we'll get something like a, an, an anxious response, we get a PTSD kind of response. The um, PTSD is typically what you think of with, you know, the old guy in the corner, something you hear a big bang, and all of a sudden he's on the floor in Vietnam again, reliving, re-experiencing nightmares, avoidance of things that um, remind him of the trauma, as well as um, an emotional numbing and heightened. Um, that's, that's interesting because you get emotional numbing, but also a lot of emotions that hyperarousal and uh, an exaggerated spiral response to pretty much anything going on. Depression or difficulties with anger. Um, complex trauma, as we said, is going to be chronic, and so with complex trauma, we often have complex reactions as well. Uh, so in dealing with this population, we don't normally see just one diagnosis. A lot of times it's four or five. There's often multiple diagnoses on this one, because we've heard familiar with the axial diagnosis of 
do some form of fantasy, we will see PTSD. Um, there is that anxiety specific to the trauma. We often see major depression, oftentimes episodic from childhood. Um, a lot of times there might be another kind of anxiety disorder, a dissociative disorder, eating disorders, as well as substance abuse as well. So you can see that the picture is very complex. There's a lot going on. Um, access to is personality disorders. Uh, that is sort of borderline personality disorder. That's something that we deal with a lot. Um, because of the essence of that is really um, captured with the idea of, I hate you, but don't leave me. You know, there's um, a fears of abandonment. They really have no sense of self and become very impulsive, very emotional, very quickly. And it can go from an, an extreme need and an intense need to have you around to a complete rage. And so a lot of emotions, a lot of uh, personal instability and difficulties in relationships. Other personality disorders might be antisocial, you know, um, like it goes into more of a manipulative way, as well as things like histrionic, which is where they're very, become very sexualized and very looking for sexual attention. The medical conditions <coughs> that we talked about, as well as um, difficulties in overall function. Um, so you can see that, you know, with all of these different um, diagnoses, there's going to be different treatments that are recommended for it. Um, so something that has been advanced by people who do a lot of work with this kind of population is actually having one diagnosis that will subsume these, pop subsume these diagnoses that will better give a, give a better clinical picture of what's actually going on for the person and inform treatment more clearly and more appropriately. And so one of those is advanced by Judith Herman, which is called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's similar, very similar things to an advanced by Van der Kolk, and his is called developmental trauma disorder, given the developmentally vulnerable parts that come in. Uh, and disorders of extreme stress, not otherwise specified, um, also called Thesnos, is another presentation of this. So it's characterized by the difficulties with the emotions that we talked about, persistent dysphoria. You can see with all of this going on, a lot of times they become very um, disenfranchised or hopeless with what's going on. Um, chronic suicidal preoccupation. There's no value of themselves or of life. And so, and that, the cutting is a way that they, um, what they've shared with me is that, you know, it helps them alleviate a lot of stress. It also shows other people how, um, how badly they're hurting as well. The emotional pain is something that others don't see and others often don't understand. So it's a way of also showing how badly they're hurting. Mm. And the explosive or inhibited anger, which is hard. You know, that's why it's so hard to get close to these people. Because, because of that rage, and people fear that, people don't understand it. And unfortunately, it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They think no one's going to love them. They become, they flip out on them and the person. And it kind of becomes a cycle in that way. The alterations in consciousness captures the dissociative features of this population. Uh, so we've got the amnesia, amnesia for traumatic events, which is characteristic of PTSD. But then we also have the transient dissociative episodes, which is that checking out, either removing themselves from the body, from their body, or feeling that things are surreal. It might not be at that point. And it just feels like everything is kind of a haze or a dream. And then the living from PTSD. Uh, alterations in self-perceptions. So I love Taylor's example of the, the bucket with the hole in the bottom. That's a, very similar to what my supervisor would talk about, which is a glass that couldn't be filled. You know, there's no sense of self. They don't know who they are. They've never had a chance to experience it or make sense of it. They've been in survival mode since they were a child. And so there's a sense of helplessness, right, which, which happens growing up in an environment like that. No matter what you try, you get shot down. Eventually you learn, you don't try, you survive. And so there's a sense of helplessness and not being able to, to make any changes to their life. Um, shame and guilt that comes from the messages that they've gotten. Being very awkward socially, they get that on the outside as well. Some sense of defilement or stigma. Unfortunately, we live in a culture that still blames the victim. You know, even kids are told if I should ask them for it, you're flirting with him. And so they're taught that it's their fault. And that's something that they carry with them a lot for a lot of them. That's a sense of complete difference from others. And they see that they never really feel that others understand them or can appreciate what's actually going on for them. Alterations in perception of the perpetrator. Um, and so they might see the person as powers or being able to be like an essential person for them. Um, so I've not dealt with a lot of that. I've not had the chance to really deal with perpetrators, but 
I feel like if you guys have seen them all, a lot of the shows with like the moms that become very overprotective and the kids really buy in to what's going on because they're mom and they know that. And so it's this belief that they are that they're um, convincible and that they are the, you know, they become very um, preoccupied with what's going on with the belief systems as well. So, Judith Herman actually did a lot of work with domestic violence. It's really interesting. She actually compares it to a person before. So we see something called Stockholm Syndrome where the person falls in love with their captor. And she says that domestic violence is actually worse because it's your intimate environment. It's someone who's supposed to love you and care about you. And that's something I've always stuck with me because this year I was told a while ago. Um, so different beliefs about the perpetrator as well as the total power. You know, a lot of times they can't see outside of what's going on because they believe that that person will fulfill everything that he has to offer. Alteration in relations with others. This is made in a personal difficulty. A lot of isolation and withdrawal. Sometimes the, the tendency of a lot of emotions are not at all. But sometimes they withdraw and will isolate. Um, difficulties with intimate relationships. So um, I've talked a lot about kind of interpersonal things, but especially if there's a history of sexual abuse. You know, taking that away so early on, there's a lot of difficulties on it. So we also do a lot of work with survivors on kind of reestablishing um, intimacy in a healthy way as well, once they're able to work through a lot of the past difficulties. The search for a rescuer, that's the IH don't leave me part. You know, they come to therapy and they feel good. They like it, there's someone there who cares about them and it feels it's great. You know, and their cup is full for a little while. But as they leave, it's gone again. And so they're always looking for someone to be around so they can feel important, so they can feel alive. Um, with that comes the distrust as well. You know that they've internalized that others hurt them and others can't be trusted, and others will let you down eventually. And they're always waiting for it. They are always looking to see when you're going to mess up. You know, because it can't be true. You can't actually care. And it's really hard to break the black and white thinking that comes with it. Um, and failures of self-protection. So unfortunately, you know, because of these difficulties, a lot of times they do end up in, in trouble again. And it's amazing how sometimes to one person, it's crisis after crisis after crisis due to a lot of what's been going on. And so it's helpful to understand where it's coming from. It's not the person is cursed, and the person's not doing it intentionally, but a lot of times they, they've been through kind of set them up for it. And as this persists, we see changes in the system of meaning. Um, loss of sustaining faith and a sense of hopelessness as well that no one will ever be able to help them understand what they're actually going to do. So I was going to share with you guys about a woman that I worked with. Um, she kind of see, I see, I see heads nodding, so I'm assuming people can relate to what's going on. Um, but it's just a woman, and like Taylor, so her name has changed as well as any identifying information. And as an African American woman in her 40s. Uh, she was married with two kids. Um, her high school grade was a GED. She was employed full time as a medical assistant when I started working with her, and she had high blood pressure, so she was taking it all. Uh, she was referred for treatment by the courts, so she didn't see any difficulties with what was going on. They heard childhood sexual abuse and called us up, and men needed treatment with us. Um, coming in, she um, that criteria for PTSD. She has a history of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, as well as traumatic loss. Um, a lot of issues of thoughts. So going through a day, thoughts would come back about experiences that she had been through. She became very distressed in reaction to reminders and would avoid situations that would remind her of past traumatic events. A lot of difficulties concentrating. The hypervigilance, so constantly being on the lookout for the next thing to happen, as well as an exaggerated several response. Uh, the anxiety levels on this lady were phenomenal. I mean, she was, I mean, this is how, this was her MO. You know, she was almost jogging the entire time. But that's how she had always been, so she didn't see anything wrong with it. Um, on her initial assessments, her anxiety came out moderate levels, uh, which is not the feeling of the room at all. Uh, depression was mild. Uh, dissociation, um, as well as PTSD, was in the clinical levels. She also met criteria for depression, um, depressed mood with crying spells. Um, recent weight gain, to increased appetite, psychomotor agitation, difficulty sleeping. Her um, discharge criteria, our end goal for treatment, was to be able to sleep through the night. And she laughed when she said that because she didn't think it was possible. So something she'd never done, she'd always heard about, figured, why not? Sure, write it down. And, you know, it was amazing by the end of treatment, seeing her face, and that was, that was the best thing that she could think of to come up with us. 
from fatigue during the day, um, excessive meals, as well as thoughts of death. She also had poor self-image and difficulties with relationships. Uh, the depression and anxiety symptoms she said went on for as long as she could remember. Um, they were episodic over the past few years, but had gotten worse following the death of her mother the year before she started working with me. Um, growing up, her father was emotionally abusive. He was a gambler and an alcoholic, and would often beat her mother in front of her and her sisters and brothers. Her mom was the primary care provider. She considered her a sweetheart and a good example of something she wanted to be just like when she grew up. Her parents divorced when she was 10. She lived with her mom until she was 14. Um, she doesn't live with her dad then because of teacher problems. Um, she lived with her father from 14 to 16 years old. Her father was the same controlling man that she knew from the beginning. Wouldn't allow her to have friends at school or participate in any activities. So at 16, she actually married another man to escape her father's house. A man who was much older than her, she said, was more like her father. Um, eventually, this became an abusive relationship. She reported emotional, physical, and sexual abuse within this relationship. And um, when she was able to eventually escape it, um, I ended up with him actually killing himself. Um, she was able to remarry to another man. She was able to not like another one at all. And um, I was fortunate enough to this gentleman at one point. Um, a great deal of trust and respect within this relationship. Um, her mom had died the year before coming in. And her mom was the, care the caregiver and the, the matriarch of the family. So this was a huge loss for her. You know, it seemed like things were finally getting better, and this really shook her up. Um, it was a loss for her and her family, and she then assumed the caregiver role. So she began looking after everyone. Um, and when I started working with her, she was working as a medical assistant, which was a very rewarding. She loved her job, but also very demanding. She would work 14 to 16 hours a day. She would call really all of the time. Um, for any of you familiar with the MMPI, it's one of the most, um, one of the best research, one of the most commonly used personality profiles. Uh, so I know who's familiar with them. These are the, the validity scales, and something that's meant about a lot with this population is the defenses. So L and K are going to be their coping resources, their ability to handle things as well as kind of protect themselves. And you see with faith, they were bottomed out, there was nothing there. Uh, the F scale is the frequency scale. It's also called faking bad because a lot of times when it's higher than this top level, uh, it's considered invalid because the person's over-reporting, they're making up all kinds of things, it's considered a cry for help. But what's consistently found in this population, and you can see I put in the average for our clinic, is that that's actually what's going on here. There's actually that many problems that they're experiencing, and that is an accurate representation of what they're going through. You see, you know, the depression and the health problems, the difficulties with law or antisocial behaviors, the paranoia, PTSD, the schizophrenia. The scale goes up because of dissociative experiences, which are considered normal. Um, and a lot of times there's um, extra activity levels as well. That's the main thing. So you can see there's a lot going on. Um, so her diagnosis for PTSD and major depression, um, which she did not meet criteria.
early victimization, we saw that with the domestic violence um, and emotional abuse, as well as difficulties with that in some other relationships. Her maladaptive behavior was giving too much. Um, she didn't mess with drugs or anything like that. But she actually ended up in the hospital several times while I was working with her um, from exhaustion between her medical conditions, the long work hours, and also trying to run everything for her family. Her body just couldn't do it anymore. And it did take three hospitalizations or thereabouts, I forget, several times she ended up in the hospital, those were hard phone calls. And, you know, she worked herself to death, essentially, trying to look after others and give them what she wasn't able to have. Um, so looking at differences in treatment, you know, what do you do with all of this that's going on? Um, type 1 trauma, the single incident response very well to something we call exposure. Uh, anyone who hears about trauma, you have to talk about it, right? And that's the essence of what? Yeah. There's a button that does that, isn't there? <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is why we work with people, not technology. Five minutes left. Okay. All right, I'll go a little quickly. All right. Um, so type 1 is exposure. Um, what happens with PTSD with the type 1 is that the person is, you know, functioning at an adult level, things are going pretty well, they've got some kind of support system, some kind of coping skills to be able to deal with stress. Something happens and functioning goes down, anxiety goes up. And a lot of the difficulties come from not being able to make sense of this trauma. A lot of times our brain, our brain tries to push it out, and that's where we get the intrusions onto our, our experience. So in, in coming in and seeing the therapist, a lot of times they'll do something called exposure. There's different versions. EMDR is where there's some kind of eye movement desensitization. Prolonged exposure is sharing it in a safe environment. And the idea here is that, you know, and trying to keep it separate, we get this high emotional arousal anytime that you think about it or anytime it comes to mind. And the idea is to eliminate that or reduce that affective response. A lot of times there will be some kind of emotional response to it. It's obviously a really difficult time. Um, but not to have it be overwhelming anymore. Um, very effective treatments, very ev it's evidence-based, a lot of research behind it for type 1. The difficulty with uh, abuse survivors is that they're not functioning at the adult level. They don't have good support systems a lot of times. They don't have the coping skills to be able to integrate that experience. So what happens is when someone walks in, you know, with this kind of history, with these kinds of difficulties, if you walk them into the worst day of their life, then a lot of times we pick the worst things but you know, making any of the experiences that they've been through, they often decompensate. And so walking into that too early um, is very counterproductive, and a lot of times they'll end up dangerous as well. Um, so working with Faith, her goals for treatment were decreasing depression, decreasing anxiety, and improving self-esteem. Um, and other goals will be added depending on the needs of the client that's coming in. Contextual therapy. Is, um, is a really great approach. I've seen it be very effective with a lot of the clients I work with. It's an integrated approach. You look at attachments, which is going to be um, having that client be able to um, build that therapeutic relationship with you to fulfill a lot of the emotional capacities that weren't developed as a child. Cognitive behavioral therapy, so we do have the cognitive restructuring that comes in as well as behavioral things like relaxation strategies. Later on, we might do um, trauma processing. And then dialectical behavior therapy, which was developed specifically for borderline personality disorder. We do a lot on core mindfulness, um, which is um, living in the, in the present moment. Um, emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness. Um, they break down how to make a request in the best way I've ever seen. Uh, as well as the stress tolerance as well to deal with the crisis that they, come, they tend to come up against. And the whole field for complex trauma has really moved to three phases of treatment. The first one is safety and stabilization, which is the most important one, um, where the main, fo the, most, the main focus of treatment really is going to be, which is building these capacities as well as the skills to be able to deal with life on its um, uh, daily, life's daily activities and responsibilities. If there are still things left specific to trauma, we can do the processing. And after that would be integration and building the identity and the self-worth. So what we, what we do in therapy um, has three components. The doctor goes outline the interpersonal part, which is going to be um, the relationship. You know, really building that bond to make sure that it's a safe place for them to be able to talk about what's going on and make sense of, what's, um, of what they've been through. The conceptual component is the client's responsibility, which is as they're able to get the stress levels down, um, make sense of what they've been through. And it's called the client-guided conceptualization. So really building um, a sense of an understanding of what they've been through as well as where they want to go. 
and then my part is transmission of the skills. So giving them the coping skills, the social skills, um, as well as the daily life skills that they might have missed. Um, we outlined six different um, priorities that we'll look at very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus on this is not on the process, it really is on the remediation of developmental gaps as well as transmission of skills. And trauma processing is not only not the focus, it's not always necessary either. What Dr. Volk has found is that a lot of times, as a person is able to build healthy relationships, able to learn to manage distress and manage emotions more effectively, a lot of times that part's not necessary. Um, so the priorities of treatment, learning to manage distress. And they always say this part, this is the deep breathing. And we make, we make them do like several times a day, that those tens, that's their daily life. That's where they operate all the time. And at 10, it comes out any different way. We become sad, we become anxious, we become angry. At that level, it's all gonna be impulse. So bringing down the overall arousal levels is our first focus. Um, doing things like coping skills, relaxation exercises, positive activities. Faith's favorite one was going for a walk on the beach with her husband. As well as cognitive restructuring, so identifying the thoughts that contribute to a lot of the worries that we're having. Um, number two is the um, experiential presence. This is the dissociative part. I think we're probably one of the only clinics that, well, probably are out of them, but we, um, the ones that I've met so far, that focus specifically on dissociation. And so that's something that we do with the core mindfulness from the DBT, as well as with other interventions as well, like the more severe presentations. Um, the critical thinking and judgment is the problem solving. You know, once we're able to get them to calm down and be able to focus, you know, helping them really learn to evaluate things. Problem solving is something that a lot of us do instinctively, uh, but if no one's ever helped you figure it out, then that's something that can be rather difficult. So working on the problem solving and the critical reasoning skills. The maladaptive um, patterns of behavior. These are the distress reduction things. Uh, and so a lot of times there is like substance abuse or um, eating disorders, those would be addressed first. Um, to make sure that they're safe and able to focus um, in the treatments with that. The expansion of the adaptive living skills is daily things that a lot of us learn at home that a lot of them weren't exposed to. And then finally we have resolution of the trauma, which is a process. So by the end of treatment, and a lot of people that came in, Faith was 